Right, good morning, friends. So, uh, what a privilege it is to be standing here this morning again. And uh, I know Haraki, Haraki has done part, part A. So, for those who, who also grew up in the, the 80s, you also know the audio tapes. And it had an a, a side and a B side, or a side one and a side two. So, that's pretty much today. So, he was side A, I'm side B. Um, God is just amazing in how he works and how he already starts preparing for what, what is to come. Um, so Mark alluded to that, Harky also alluded to it. Um, the scripture that, that, we, that I'm going to also be sharing this morning and that was already shared earlier this morning, Harky shared from verse 1 to 10 and God placed on my heart verse two, uh, 10 to 24. <laughs> so... So it's amazing how intentional God is with what he wants to deliver and what, how he wants to change people's hearts uh, this morning. So um, for you, those of you who've been attending this weekend, I'm sure you would agree that it has been, has been um, life-changing. Um, I think there's been, um, Janus keeps on using the words, so many bombs that, that have been dropped because it broke open sometimes things that, we, that were unclear to us. It broke open realities and truths to us. Um, and I trust that, that this morning will also continue in that, in that vein. It might not be groundbreaking, but it is about Jesus. And anything about Jesus is groundbreaking. So um, if we look at this whole weekend is about the heart. And uh, Proverbs uh, 4 verse 23 talks about this and it says, Above all else, guard your heart with everything you do flows from it. So why are we doing what we're doing this weekend? Is because this is where everything starts. This is where life starts. It starts from the heart. So if we don't, if we don't guard our hearts, there's a, there, there's a consequence to that, and we can end up with a corrupt heart. So Tasso actually you know, so beautifully explained that to us um, over the weekend, but when we are when we are operating in God's righteousness and we're standing in God's righteousness, that is what fills our heart. Our hearts are filled with His goodness, with His wisdom, and with His righteousness. But the moment that we do not operate within righteousness, that is when we start um, opening our hearts for false beliefs, for harmful desires, and for negative perceptions. So this morning I trust that that as, as we go through the word, that it will minister to you so that you, that it unlocks that wisdom, it unlocks that righteousness, and it speaks to that and the goodness that is, that is in us. So I want us to um, read this morning, so as you know, so you can already go there, 1 John 3 verse 10. So Harki discussed this morning, he spoke about our identity, knowing that we're a child of God. That's where it all starts. So this morning, I'm following on from that to say, but what does that look like? So in verse 10, um, it says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message um, that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another not as Cain, who was the, uh, of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has his, um, this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure, the, assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us um, commandment. Um, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity, Lord, of again just spending time in your presence. Father, I ask that you guide my tongue and that you just use me as a vessel this morning, an empty vessel, Father. And Lord, that your word be spoken here this morning. Father, we, we love you and we appreciate you. And we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so um, in the previous meeting, Harki actually gave such nice context um, around the scripture about um, John. And, um, and he spoke about, you know, the, the circumstances of John writing this book. But this specific, if you look at the um, John 1, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, is in that time, so John was already quite old. He was in his 80s, and he couldn't travel anymore. 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John was specifically written to the believers to say to them, to warn them of false prophets and false teachers, to say, watch out for them. And these are the things that you'll know them by, and here's the, here are the things that we know that we are saved. So he speaks about those specifically. And then the specific scripture that I'm um, looking at this morning, there are specifically three themes that, that come out. The first one is around righteousness. So that comes through, uh, comes through quite strongly. The second one is around love. And the, the last one is around having confidence before God. Now, what God has specifically stirred me with in terms of, of um, this weekend, is to look at what does it look like to live with a surrendered heart, a heart that is surrendered. So this passage that we've just read now, it talks about the outworking of, of love. We see the result of a, a heart that is surrendered because if we, in order for us to understand what a, a, a surrendered heart looks like, these are the actions that flow from it. So this morning, we're going to look at some of these actions, some of these things that flow from, from the scripture to say, but this, these are the character traits of a heart that is surrendered. Now, why is it important for us to look at a heart that is surrendered? Because it's for us to start stepping into our purpose. If we do not have a heart that is surrendered, we cannot be used by God for that which he has designed us for. He has specifically designed us to be used in a very specific way. And um, it's, we even see this in Romans 6 verse 13 where it says, we offer ourselves in a decisive way. So that means that we choose. It's a decisive way. I do this deliberately. And I yield all my abilities to God. How beautiful is that? So, I do this de deliberately and I yield everything, everything to God so that I can be used the way that he wants to use me. So it's the same if you look at, um, as an example, so um, I've been to a, you know, a couple of team buildings in my, in my life and one of those things that they normally take you on is, is archery. So I always think it's a great idea to, to teach people who have never been um, using or that's not used to a bow and arrow to try and shoot. 
And I think there are so many more injuries that come from, from that than, uh, than I think any of the other team building activities. But the beauty of a, of, of a bow and arrow is for the archer to properly use that, so for, for the archer to get the, the arrow into the target exactly where we, we planned it to be, what he needs to do is he needs to use the bow. If the bow is not doing what it's supposed to do, the arrow is never going to reach its target. So sometimes also we find that, that even that string, that bow string, that as you pull it, if it's not tuned, it is not going to release the arrow to reach the target. If we don't li live a surrendered life, we are never going to be able to, to be that bow, to get the arrow into where God is placing that arrow to go. God wants to use us to reach the target, very specifically, very strategically. This morning, again, was just, a, uh, I think, such a good example of exactly that. But let's take a look at, at what some of these, these character traits uh, then look like. So the first character trait that we're picking up in the scripture is a heart surrendered lives righteously. And where we see this is specifically we, we, uh, we, we see the story of, of uh, Cain and Abel. And in verse 11 and 12, so he uses the example of Cain and Abel. But he makes some strong statements. He says, Cain, he's got these evil actions and he's of the, the wicked one. Now, in Genesis, we actually read that when Eve conceived Cain, she actually said, um, this is from, from, from God. The Lord has provided. So to see how the enemy is always going to try and make sure that we don't step into the fullness of what it is that we've been created for. He then also goes on to, to call Abel righteous. Now, in order for us to really understand the story, and I want us to just go a bit deeper into that. So, Barant is going to put those, the, the scripture up so you don't have to, to uh, page through your Bibles or apps. And we're going to be reading from, from verse 3. And it says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So it's a powerful, um, it's a powerful, powerful uh, piece of scripture there. Because if you look at that scripture, so further on, Cain then goes and he kills, um, he kills Abel. Um, but when they were asked to bring offerings, so this stage in Scripture, there's no, there's no specific um, details around whether the, the offers that they, were, they were, that they were required to give were for forgiveness. It wasn't for forgiveness. But this, what's come through is that the offer, offerings that they had to bring was for worship. It's to worship God. So what we then see is that God also didn't differentiate between Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a herdsman. But to God, they were equally important. They had exactly what they needed for what they had to do. They had access to exactly the same. The big difference is, and God said that, is Cain's sacrifice had a deficit. There was a lack. And he said that. He said, and if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. So God said to him, I see, what, I see the, your heart. I see the motive for you bringing this offering to me. And what's, 
And that is the big th difference between Cain and Abel, the motive of their hearts. Because Cain brought from a place of, yeah, I'm just gonna tick a box. Yet Abel brought his best. He brought his best. Cain just brought a token gift. But there's even more to this because God then spoke to Cain. He said to him, sin lies at your door. Its desire, its desire is, for, is for you, but you can rule over it. So he gave Cain a heads up to say, watch out, watch out. This is what's going to happen. And Cain ignored that. And he sinned further. God gave him a way out. He said to him, you could repent. By repenting, you can move out of this. You can correct your heart posture again. But Cain didn't choose that, that option. What, we, what we're reading about here is that Abel was credited for being righteous, not for what he brought, but why he brought it. Because Cain, um, Abel came from a place of saying, I'm going to honor and worship my Lord and Savior. That's where the place I'm coming from. So for us, what is righteous living then looking like? Because righteous living is wanting to do what pleases God, not what pleases man. That is righteous living. That's living with a heart that is surrendered because from this place, I can then go and say, you know what? I want to please you, Lord. In everything that I do, that I say, that I live, I want to please you. If it means that I am offending other people, I'm okay with that. Because scripture says the world hates us in any case. So what have we got to lose? <laughs> but also the, the cornerstone of a repentant life, of a um, righteous life is living with a, in a repentant way. Because living with a repentant heart keeps us in a place of always being surrendered, of always making sure that we are aligned to what God has in store for us, that we don't have any obstacles, that we are not pulling away from God, that we're moving closer because we have freedom in, in approaching Him. And that freedom of approaching Him we see now in the second point is a heart that is surrendered experiences rest. So John encourages us, if I, we just go back to, to that scripture, God encourages us, uh, John encourages us to say in verse 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth and we shall assure our, assure our hearts of uh, before him, and if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So he already says that for us to be in a place of, of rest and of peace, we have to be in his presence. That's where we need to spend time with God, and, and being in God's presence is an intimate setting. It is not just a general going out into public, it's a very specific, I'm going to be intentional about my time, of, about connecting with, with the Father. And it says, especially, especially if I feel condemnation and if I feel guilt. And then, then John goes on and he says, well, there are two things for you to already know that you can step into rest. Because first, God is greater than our hearts and God knows everything, number two. But what does that mean? Because that means that if I, step, um, if I stand in that presence with God, God knows everything. He takes the one step back. He takes everything into consideration. He looks at what Jesus has done for us on the cross as well. He doesn't just look at us in this moment, in this place. He looks at the full picture. So he basically puts on a new lens when he looks at us. Because in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, it says Paul calls us, a new creation. 
And why does he call us a new creation? Because we've been made right with God. And he uses that lens to look at us, to, to help us, to connect with us. So God always looks at us through the completed works of the cross. That's the lens that he uses. But this is only available, this rest is only available to us if we surrender our hearts to him. If we come from a place of just not just surrendering, but trusting him. Spending time in his presence to trust him. Because we can only trust him if we know him. And so myself, my wife, we've been, uh, we'll be married 26 years this year. Uh, sorry, been together 26 years, but uh, married for 22. And um, that's a long time. And we would not have been able to get to this place, first of all, because of the grace of God, but also because we made sure that we had time for one another so that we grew up together. We grew in our faith, grew in our relationship, grew in life together. That's the only reason, because we made sure that there was, we had time for one another. Without that, we would have been strangers. And that's many times what happens in, in marriages today, is that people drift apart because they don't spend time together. Okay, that was just a freebie. But... Uh, but it is from that place that we have a relationship with a father that comes the boldness and the courage in which we can step into the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Now, our story is a, is a bit different. Um, not different, but I think it can relate to, to some of you as well. But in 2018, we went through a bit of a tough, a tough spot. And... Um, Middle of 2018, I had to sell my car because we were not going to see the end of 2018 had that been the case because we were running, we were going out through finances um, just from a living po a point of view and savings and everything because we didn't have a lot of income and work at that stage. And um, God had to confront my heart in that time because I was fearful, anxious, I had, I had no trust in him. I realized later, did it at the time, because at the time you think, yeah, I've got this. You know, this is just a natural way for me to feel, but that's not the reality. That's just the enemy saying, how's it? So for me, that was something I had to work through, and God had to work through my heart specifically around this. And um, throughout 2018, actually it started at the beginning of the year, he started calling me back to his word every single time. And I had excuses. I'm to this, I'm to that, I'll get to that. So beginning December 2018, and I'm in one of these desperate states again. And my wife shares a, a link with me from, um, it's archives of Derek Prince and um, all of his teachings and, and um, um, uh, sermons and preachers and all those things. So it was quite a big um, archive and it was uh, made available for free. And I started just scrolling through some of those on the Sunday evening. I was just scrolling through this, trying to find something that spoke to my heart. And there it was, there's this, this headline and it immediately it caught my attention and I wanted to immediately find out more because this sounds like this is exactly what I need. This is going to encourage me. But I think, you know, God has a sense of humor because um, that was clickbait for me. Because I went in expecting one thing, but the article was about spending time with Christ. He called me so personally to say, I need time with you. Next morning, I was in the Word. I kid you not. And what was amazing is suddenly the word opened up in a new way to me because I approached it from, I want to learn more. I want to know more. I want to know God's heart in this. Now, there was a time also in our lives when we went to Namibia for a, for a tour and 
It's one of the, our favorite places when we went because as you walk in the desert, you expect nothing. But we found life in every single spot almost in the desert. These little treasures hidden away. And that's what it started feeling like to me when I started reading the word at that level. Because the Holy Spirit started revealing so many new things. It opened up the word in such a profound way. And then what happened was, so there's a lot of promises spoken over us. There was a lot of, of um, also promises that God gave us directly from the word. You don't always have to go and wait and get, uh, wait for somebody to give you a promise. Because the more time that you spend in the word, the more time God has the opportunity of giving you a promise and speaking directly into your life. And that's what we've experienced. So in January, it was a tough month. I'm not going to lie. But God. Because in spite of all of that, what started happening with both of us, because we started, we didn't have, a, we had a lot of time because we didn't have a lot of things to do. So at that stage, we made sure that we spent time in the Word. We started studying the Word together. We started praying together. What it did for us, for our relationship, which was, it was incredible, but what it did for us as a couple, it was because both of us started experiencing rest. In spite of the storms, we experienced rest. And we got to a point where we said, we can lose everything now. It's okay. We're okay. Because as long as we have God, we have all that we need. And if somebody told me this back then, I would not have believed it. But I can, I can share that with you from a place of experience. Because that changed our lives in a, in a profound way. Because as we've, I mean, the, the, the bad times don't always just disappear. They, they do pop up from time and time and again. But you go through those times with a completely different mindset and a completely different heart than you went in the first time. Because now my heart is surrendered. I know who my father is. I know who my provider is. I don't have to look at man. I don't have to look at the circumstances because God can change everything within a day, within a minute, within a second. So I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in anxiety. But that is because our hearts were surrendered that we could feel and experience that rest. The third point, or the third character trait that, that we also see in the scripture is that a heart surrendered lives by example. Now, this is an interesting one because it's one of those verses that stares you in the face, but you don't realize it. God has always led by example. Always. In this case as well, he has shown, he's shown us, he's given us the example of what it looks like to have a surrendered heart when he gave his son for us. So God himself has surrendered his heart towards us. And it is, <laughs> but it, and it's so beautiful in the this, in this scripture because it says, so God gave if, if, okay, I want to sh just quickly show you this. So 1 John 3 verse 16 reads, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. So speaking about Jesus. But take the one away and you get to this scripture which says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 16, God gave his son. 1 John 3 verse 16, Jesus laid down his life. That was the example. God gave his best, but Jesus also accepted that and he said, I'm laying my, my life down. It shows a love and we, and Arki touched on it, and, and, and um, Tasso also touched on it over the weekend, this agape love. 
Now, agape love is a love that is surrendered, a sacrificial, because it's a love that gives. Now, in the pre-marriage course that Tanya and myself are um, presenting at, at the church, uh, facilitating, there's a, this is a, a, a definition of the agape love that we normally use. So for those who have, who have attended the, the pre-marriage course, this would be um, old news for you. And for those who haven't attended it, um, for those who still are going to attend it, this is a bit of a teaser for, for what is to come. But I want Baron to just put it on the screen. And it says, un- so agape love, a love that is sacrificial is unconditional love that is always giving and impossible to take or be a taker. It devotes total commitment to seek your highest best, no matter how anyone may respond. This form of love is totally selfless and does not change whether the love given is returned or not. So, this is also the command to husbands, just FYI, that a husband should love his wife in this way. This is the standard, this is the benchmark, that we ought to love our wives. But... um, What is beautiful is God gave his best to a world that rejected him. He gave a way out. He gave his best to a world that was not worthy of forgiveness. But that was not his heart. That is just showing what his sacrificial love looked like. Because he gave his best whether or not he was going to receive that in return. Whether or not, he knew that a lot of people were not going to choose to stand under this salvation, to stand under this gift. He knew that, yet he still went ahead and he said, I will still give my best to redeem my best. Now, if we look further in, um, in 1 John um, 3, It then speaks about, it says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So what he's saying is that for us to love, to live by example, to love by example is we should not love by by our words, by by our speech and our language. That's what that uh, word and tongue speaks to. It says what it's our language and our speech that we use. He says, no, we should love by deed, which is action, and by truth. In other words, no falsehood. Be pure. Again, motive of the heart. What is the motive of your heart when you give? Give freely, but give it, give it righteously. It says... Whoever has, um, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So what God is saying to us is that he wants us not to just profess love because anybody can do that. Cardis have been doing that for years. but it's in action. It's in our action. We have to demonstrate his love. It's in a demonstration. And by doing that, that's how we become an example for others. Because we follow the main example, the big example that's been set for us. And from a place of gratitude, we can then surrender and say, Lord, I will follow you. I will give and I will love the way that you want me to love. Which brings me to the next point, which is a heart surrendered obeys God's commands. So a couple of years ago, um, I've attended uh, one of the NCMI conferences. And um, the conference, uh, it was, uh, I think it was actually Global Connect, or, uh, World Connect. And Tyron Daniel was, was preaching there. And he started his 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 message or his preach with asking a question. 
I'm actually asking two questions. So the first question is, how do we know that God loves us? Okay, so that's fairly simple, because he sent his, his son to die for us. Very simple. Then he asked the question, how does God know that we love him? That's not so easy. And the answer to that was in our obedience. And I thought, so that struck me. I mean, it was, it's beautiful, but why obedience? Was there no other way that God was going to be able to measure our love for him? All our good works, <laughs> which we always think it's, now I'm, I'm, getting, I'm catching God's eye by doing this and this and this. No, obedience, I believe obedience is the ultimate act of surrender. And why do I say that? Because you are actually doing something completely different to what you might want to do. You're doing it for somebody else. So that type of obedience, so obedience is not necessary, it's not easy for us. That's why our flesh always rebels against this. That's why we always have desires to go that way, even though God is calling us this way. And um, we see this as well, because Jesus was obedient unto death. Yes. And even in that picture, it was so beautiful, because it says that in, when Jesus was praying before, before he was taken captive to be crucified, he asked for this cup to pass him. But if not, then he'll see it through. If that is not what God has in, in store for him or in mind for him, then he'll see it through. And he saw it through until the very end. That was obedience unto death. But the powerful thing of obedience is the moment that we live in obedience, we start unlocking the promises that Christ has for us. We start unlocking the purpose of what God has designed us for. Now, in, so in this passage, we see that um, Paul spoke about, he said in verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So he gave us two commandments in this, which is the first, obviously, is to believe on the name of Jesus. So to, to take what Jesus has done for us and make that a reality and accept that gift so that we can start walking in that and that freedom that, that, um, that goes along with that. But the second part talks about love one another. Now, the best place where this was also referenced is in Matthew 22, Verse 34 to 14, that we are going to put this up on the screen again. So the context for this is when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, what is the greatest commandment, trying to trick him, this was Jesus' response with regards to that. And he said, from verse 35, then one of them, a, law, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great command. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. So, when we look at that, that's the commandment. Love one another. That's, that's where it comes from. It's, and there are three there are three parties in that that we need to love. The first one is to love God. And he says we need to love God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. We need to love God with everything that we are. So the, the soul refers to our inner, the, who I am, the, the, the me, everything. And the, the mind obviously is intellectually. So everything that, that is me, I need to love God. I need to, to honor him in that. That's his command to us. But there's a second command, obviously, is that we need to love others like ourselves. 
So he says our neighbors. Now when Jesus spoke about neighbors, he didn't speak about the guys that just live right next door. Jesus spoke about everyone. He spoke about believers and unbelievers. Not just believers. I think so many times we find ourselves getting to a spot to say, well, this is only for believers. It's for us to love believers and unbelievers. The unlikable ones. The unforgivable ones. That's a bit tougher. We need to love all of them. We need to love our brothers. We need to love our neighbors. We need to love everyone because they're part of the Father's creation. It's because we love our Father. And because we love the Father, we love His creation. It's His expression of His love. Now, people find themselves in a spot where they, they have been hurt before when loving people. But it wasn't because of love, it is because of the lack of love. You will never be hurt. Nobody has ever been hurt by being loved. And that is why God has given us that command. That we need to love. He loved first and that's why we need to love. The absence of love is the ultimate rejection. Because we feel isolated, we feel rejected, alone. And that's how many people, many of us feel these days as well. Because we're not receiving love, we're not getting love from the people that's supposed to be giving us love. But the Father always says, come to me and I will show you what love is. I will reveal to you what love is. But there's a third party that needs to also be loved, and it's ourselves. And this party is normally the most difficult one to do. Because in this, what the writer was talking about here was for us to love ourselves means that we need to care for ourselves, respect ourselves, and be kind towards ourselves. Because we cannot we cannot love others if we cannot love ourselves. And we cannot experience the love of God if we're not open to receive it from Him. And if we don't have any type of identity. So if you can't love yourself, you're going to struggle loving other people and you're going to even more struggle loving God. Now, the big question is, how do I surrender? Because it sounds all good. So these are all the, the characteristics or the character traits of a heart that is surrendered. But how do I surrender? Now, there are two things. The first one is it's, you have to choose it. It's a choice. We've seen with all of these different traits there's, there's a role that we have to play. We have to choose. If we don't choose this, it can't be real for us. We can't experience that. The second one is to understand our responsibilities. Now, in 1993, in the Journal of Biblical Counseling, there was a guy called Paul Tripp, and he came up with this model called the Circles of Responsibility. Now, the circles of responsibility speaks of two things. It speaks of a circle of responsibility and a circle of sovereignty. Those are the two circles. And what he, was, what he was saying is that the circle of responsibility speaks to all the things that I have direct responsibility over and I can do something about that's within my control. This is what God entrusts me with. It's my skills. It's everything that he has that he has deposited in me. It's the opportunities. It's also his, um, his commands. So those things that we are struggling with or the things that we always have excuses for, he's saying those things 
The things that, I've, that I'm asking of you, I'm not asking of you because I know that you can't do it. I'm asking because I know you can do it. So be responsible for what I'm placing in your hand. That's your, your, that's your sphere of, or your circle of responsibility because it has a direct impact on you, but you can also have a direct impact on it. Circle of sovereignty is slightly different. It's, it still has a massive impact on my life, but I have zero control over it. It could be like the economy, it could be crime. We have no direct control over that. Those are the things that we need to place at God's feet. That's what we need to surrender. That's what surrender looks like. They're saying, Lord, I'm taking that which you are, um, that you're entrusting me with. I'm taking that and I'm being responsible with that. But that that is not for me, I'm laying down at your feet. I'm not taking your responsibilities upon myself. And what we see there is the moment that we start stepping into that, you don't feel that burden on your shoulders anymore. Because what we tend to do is we tend to take all the stuff that's in the circle of sovereignty and we place it on our shoulders. Because I want to make a difference. I want to change. And we do that so many times where I was also because I, have a, I had a lack of trust. I haven't surrendered. I haven't surrendered control because that's what it means. It's saying, Lord, I have no control over this and I'm not gonna stop lying to myself that I think I do. I'm gonna release this to you, Father, open-handed, not taking it back. I know some people actually do go out there and take it back. Leaving it at the Father's feet. So, and we can even see this in Galatians five, uh, 6 verse 5. It says, for each one should carry their own load. Specifically talking about the circle of responsibility. This is what is required of us. Because in the circle of responsibility, we obey God. In the circle of sovereignty, we trust God. So when we know that we get this right, we start seeing that uh, we start trusting God with our lives. If we start getting this right, that we surrender our hearts on a daily basis, we start trusting God because it means that we have a, an intimate relationship with Him. We also start experiencing freedom because we have left all the responsibilities that are not for us, we have left with God. The, those that, that God wants us to entrust uh, to him and that he wants us to trust him with. We also start living righteously because the mot our motives of our hearts are righteous. We don't come from a place of where we're feeling corrupt or having corrupt dealings. We also start demonstrating his love to his people. And it starts by, by us loving ourselves accepting what God has created and who he has created. We start obeying God and we start following his example. He gave everything. We need to be able to give everything. I want you to, I want us to close our eyes while I'm asking the worship team to join on the stage if you're finding yourself in a spot this morning where you're saying Lord I have not fully surrendered my heart there are so many places that I still want to still keep control but if that is you I want you to stand up and say, Lord, this morning I'm coming and I'm just reconnecting, I'm resubmitting my heart, resurrendering my heart to you this morning. So, 
It's not about performance. It's a decision, it's a choice that you need to make. I'm choosing to surrender everything that I am, being sold out. So Lord, for the people who are standing, Lord, we, we come this morning and Father, we lay it all down at your feet and Father, we make the choice this morning to say, have your way, Father. We're choosing to surrender our hearts so that we can live righteously. We can experience your rest. We can live by your example and that we can obey your commands. Father, I ask that you, that you touch each of these hearts Father, where there's, at the moment, where there might even be places where there's, it's, it's dying, that you'll reawaken those hearts. Holy Spirit, for you just to minister to these hearts right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And there's, there's one more group that I want, that I want to, that I'm really feeling on my heart this morning is, if you're finding yourself in a spot where you can't love yourself, if that is you, if the Holy Spirit has already highlighted that because you know you feel nothing for yourself. I want you to respond this morning, come to the front so that we can, we can pray for you. You've tried it yourself, but you don't know how anymore. <laughs>